he was very charming and, and um, very attentive, very kind, very willing to listen, interested, just charming. We already knew each other for years. We weren't like close friends, but we got closer when I moved back to my birth country where I had originally met him. And I was alone with a baby and he was there for me. I mean, emotionally, um, he was very nice and helpful and we had really good talks at that time. In the beginning, my ex was the perfect woman, the woman that I uh, always dreamt about. You know, in every aspect she would treat me like like my dreams, you know, perfect. <laughs> like he wanted a lot of my attention. Now that would be a red flag, but then it felt very flattering. I was like, wow, he really likes me because he really wants to talk to me. He wants to spend a lot of time with me. He wants to Skype, even though I just saw him an hour ago. But then it felt very flattering. I, I wasn't used to being acknowledged in that way. A month or two later, we were living together. It should just make me feel really fantastic. I don't know, it's like a drug or something. We know how it is when you fall in love the first time, but this was something extra special. What changed was, it's kind of hard to describe because it's so subtle, just little things about me. Um, how do I explain this? Don't, don't put your sho shoes over there. Don't wear these pants. Don't lay on the bed like this. Don't whatever you know the abuse it's it built up very gradually so you don't recognize it as abuse because he made it seem like there was just this argument or this discussion that we had to get out of this problem we needed to solve together even though it was his created problem that i had nothing to do with it was ambiguous enough to believe that it wasn't really a thing. Maybe I was just being too sensitive, you know? But it started with, um, yeah, digs at how I looked. It was when we met friends. He would say, the way you talk, I don't like the way you talk. And it just gradually progressed to him, you know, kicking me, grabbing my throat, and then denying it, you know? <laughs> Narcissistic abuse is simply the sum total of all known ways to abuse other people. It could be physical, could be emotional, could be verbal, could be psychological, could be financial, could be legal. Narcissistic abuse is impersonal, precise, devastating, accurate. It's, it's like a cruise missile. It homes in on the victim and, and eradicates the victim, annihilates the victim. That's why narcissistic abuse, subjectively speaking, feels much, much worse to any other traditional forms of abuse. Let me start to say that we all have some narcissistic tendencies, only you have to have a lot of them to be called or diagnosed as a narcissist. The main thing is egocentristic, and that's where you can put all the other behaviors around. Narcissism is not something you can see from the outside. It doesn't discriminate. Uh, you can be a ma uh, man or a woman, black or white, high or low education. The main thing is lack of love. They act out of fear. So the big ego is constantly part of their daily life. They always act from ego. So arrogance and self-importance is a very common thing. And if you always act from fear, it means you are gonna be uh, on top of everybody else, what they do. You want to control and manipulate everything. He was very 
charming and willing to hang out with me and spend time with me and spend a lot of attention on me. Like he, he, he was very attentive. Well, she really made me feel like this is our place, this is our little nest and, and you're my prince on the white horse and I'm going to treat you like you've always wanted to be treated and I'll pamper you and all that stuff. So it was the best thing that you can imagine. In the beginning of the relationship, it will be all love, 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 love. You are put on a pedestal and you really feel like you have met your real soulmate because they will tune into you in whatever you like, they will like. At least they will say so. So if you like the color red, in the beginning of the relationship, they love the color red. In the end, you will find out they hate red, but anyway. So in the beginning, they really act like you're a perfect, perfect match. But only as long as they think it's necessary to get you. So that stage will depend on how long it to take them to get her into their power and control. So you can say that it's going all well until you get married or until you will be pregnant or until you are at least within their control and they think you can't get out anymore. So whatever way, then it will stop. Things start to change quite quickly after a couple of weeks. Um, I guess two, three weeks, the first signs started coming. We, would, we wouldn't go out as much anymore, we'd just stay in the house. I think it had to happen gradually or else it would have been too noticeable and then I would have checked out earlier, but because it happened so slowly, I, I was taken for a loop, really. It started with him criticizing everything I did, from me parenting my son, to my work, to the way I looked, my friends, even the way I organized the dishes, I had to do it in exact the same way he did it, otherwise he'd explode. She would put me down quite a lot, you know, like, um you're not that great a musician because otherwise you would have made it already. Um, you know, you're trying to make this Indian dish, but you know, this is not the way an, uh, an Indian dish should, should be. She, she would criticize most of my life, actually. You know, new pants, new haircut. Everything from how you talk to how you dress to the choices that you make to the people that you hang out with, the TV that you watch, the music that you listen to. The, the, you know, the, the way you look at people on the street. He critiqued everything. In the beginning, I used to go against it, or how do you say that? Just, you know, it's, well, not start a fight, but just, you know, like, gave me my own space and stuff. But at, the more time progresses, the more you think, well, you know, these are just some rules. It's, there's something with her that makes her do this kind of thing. I don't care where I put the shoes. I'll put the shoes wherever I want to, wherever she wants me to put them. And I didn't really feel anything about that anymore. I just did it, you know, like a, a puppy or something. But when I would drive home, I would think, you know, she's crossing some lines or something. I felt something was wrong, but I didn't exactly like abuse felt like such a strong word even when he became physical it still f didn't feel real because he made it a, like his business to make me not believe my memories he was very very like you shouldn't believe your own memories you should believe what i tell you you know so even when something happened to me i still didn't believe it happened to me The narcissist divides all people into two basic groups. Those who can provide him with narcissistic supply on a regular basis, high-grade narcissistic supply, unmitigated, unadulterated with criticism or disagreement, or and those who cannot. Those who cannot are devalued and discarded. Those who can are groomed, nurtured, maintained, until they no longer provide narcissistic supply. In the end, it's all about energy. 
Narcissists are feeling empty inside, so they need other people's energy to fill them up. And they try to do that with um, getting emotions out of somebody else. And it can be emotion as love, it can be emotion as fear, it can be lots of different emotions. But in the end, they always try to manipulate you to get something out of you, some emotion. Um, when she abused me, it made me feel mostly like it was all my fault that I did this to myself, that she was there in my life for a reason and that reason was to change me because I, I'm an asshole and without her I would stay the asshole unless I listened to her and, and, and uh, behaved the way she told me to behave, then I would be, become a better person. So it made me feel like, well, not worthless, but like I had to be grateful to her because she discovered those things in me that were not okay and she was there to change them for me as long as I listened to her. The first thing that changed was my feeling, I guess. He had helped me after I moved back to the Netherlands and let me stay at his house for like two or three weeks until I had my own place. And it was a hard time for me, you know, re rebuilding my life from scratch, uh, being a single mom, but he was taking credit for it. Um, when we got into a relationship, he was constantly saying like, he made me. Uh, it is even weird to repeat that, knowing how hard I worked to start up my new life here. Uh, he was saying that I wouldn't have accomplished anything without him and would rub that into my face whenever there was an argument. I was actually feeling quite proud of myself of how well I dealt with that situation because I came here into this country with nothing. But it was like he wanted to take that pride away from me. I had to be thankful, which of course I was, but even thankful to him for the things I accomplished myself. The abuse was detrimental to my self-esteem. Like, if I had any when I entered the relationship, I had none when I left it. Like, honestly, he annihilated any piece of self-esteem I still had left. He made me feel very small and insecure. And in the long term, he made me lose my self-esteem and my self-worth and everything that was important to me it seemed to be gone after a while. Yeah, she isolated me from everything and everybody. I used to have a lot of friends before I met her. I was always, I'm a very social person. And in the time that we were together, um, we didn't see anybody. It was practically, I lost, well, didn't lose all my friends. I just didn't, never talked to anybody anymore. Really, absolutely nobody, just, just to my parents every once in a while. He would say things to me like, my friends weren't good enough, my friends didn't have the best interest, uh, my friends, they weren't real friends. So he was constantly trying to say bad things about my life and I was constantly defending my friends, like, no, my, my friends are not like that at all. And especially as he stayed at my house for a very long time, I was made to feel guilty every time I wanted to see somebody. Like I betrayed him or something and he never went out to see any friends for himself. So whenever somebody came over, he would put up a fight about it later. He even threatened to kill one of my best friends, one he never even met in his life. So. In the end, I felt so uncomfortable that I didn't invite people over anymore. I only saw his friends and his family. But the thing is, when you're inside of it, it's not that black and white. I knew my friends were good people, but he made it seem like he saw something that I didn't about them and he wouldn't let it go. He made it seem like he was helping me, trying to see the truth about other people in the world because he loved me so much. It was one big show of manipulation. 
So they will try to break the bond between anybody you're close connected with or anybody you love to gain more power and control over you. So they will destroy anything which gets in their way. So your connection with your family might be sabotaged. You're free, you will get into fights because of them with your friends. They will try to do everything to destroy your social network. Another part of the isolation that you always used to live in the city. Um, she had this big thing about us being this perfect little family and uh, so we should move into the country, buy a house and just be this happy little family. So I went with that. I bought a house in the middle of the country. I bought the house. One week later she says, I'm never going to live here. I'm going to stay in the city. You just stay here. And later I thought, you know, at the moment you don't realize, you know, what the hell just happened, man? I thought we were going to have this life together. But later I found out this is also an isolation technique or something. She just wanted me to have nothing to do with any other people. So I live in the middle of nowhere with no neighbors, nothing. Well, I have some neighbors, but you know what I mean? It's a big difference to the city. So, But mostly in all those years, I had no contact with anybody. If, any, if, somebody, if people would call me friends or something, I would just not react. It is about them waiting for you to be so invested and be so trusting and be so loving and you are already head over heels with them and then they show you who they are they show you the monster when they know they have you that's why mine wanted me to live with him that's why mine wanted to claim me so that i couldn't go anywhere the moment he showed me his true self he wanted total control over my life he wanted control over the things i did the people i saw but also he wanted control over the way I was thinking. So when I would have my own opinion about something or if I would disagree with him about something, he would keep me hostage and wouldn't let me go. And I'm talking hours and hours. He wouldn't let me go until I agreed with him. And the funny thing is, sometimes it felt like brainwashing. In, in the end, after many, many hours of him having, having him scream at me and making his own uh, statements clear, I felt like, yeah, well, maybe he is right, even though I knew, like, this, this doesn't make sense. He made, like, the, the weirdest things sound good. And then when he would be gone and I would come back into my own energy, I felt like, why? Why did I believe him? So why do we experience that psychopaths want absolute control over people in their environment? And often also just one person in their environment. It is because they are really damaged little children who have not received, in many cases, the attention they needed to be able to develop themselves. And then it becomes an obsession for them to control somebody so that they do the exact thing that they think they need to fulfill their need. I mistook this control for love because I could see him make an effort and I could see him always coming back. And I wasn't used to that. And so I thought, well, he must really care about me. But I didn't see that it had nothing to do with love. It had everything to do with him controlling me and seeing me as his, like he, he owned me. Many victims believe that the person they are dealing with, whether it be a psychopath or a narcissist or both, that he or she loves them. Whereas what they experience is a show, but a very convincing show. They are seeing a convincing mask, a perfection mask. Most people, when they hear the term psychopath, think that psychopaths are these serial killers. These cases exist, but they are very rare. Most psychopaths never go to jail. They just walk among us in society. 
If you walk on the street and you pass 20 people, statistically, you have encountered one psychopath. They need you in a state in which you can't function to your um, to the best of your abilities, be it physically, like for instance, my mom kept me physically weak by you know medicating me herself, and my ex kept me mentally weak by making me doubt all my decisions, making me doubt everything I stood for. So they need you weak in in some department and dependent on them for even your most basic needs. Some narcissists do it by keeping you financially dependent even, you know, making sure you can't go anywhere, making sure you have to live with them and in a new city where you don't know anyone, where you can't find a job so they can control your behavior. So they need you in a weakened state to have influence. A majority of people who suffer from narcissistic personality disorder are also psychopaths because they have no functioning conscience. She had a temper, so she could change like this within a second and be, become really aggressive and, and blame me for whatever she could find at the moment. During this relationship, I became very much alert. I was always walking on eggshells because we could be at the beach, for instance, and having a really great time. And all of a sudden, he could throw a bomb at me like, what are you thinking about? You're thinking something negative about me, aren't you? And yeah, it, it was usually things like that, that all of a sudden I had to defend myself for something I did not do. So everything I did became a, a potential source of anger. The way I put down a plate for dinner, if I didn't put down a plate right, then that would be a reason for him to get angry. Even a sigh would be enough to, to, to stir a fight. It didn't end with me saying, no, no, I, I wasn't thinking that. It, because he wouldn't stop until I would acknowledge, like, yes, indeed, you're right, I was thinking something negative about you. We would have to go out to get groceries, for instance. We would have to go out on the street every once in a while. And as soon as there would be any woman in, the neighbor, in, in a, in a uh, 100 meter radius of me, she would go off like that. You know, why are you looking at that bitch? And you know, you're just following your dick. And you know that she would hit me with words. She wasn't aggressive in the and that she would physically harm me, but she would go, her words would just, she would just verbal diarrhea all over me about all the things that I did wrong, but looking at other women and stuff. Me wanting to watch Dr. Phil when I came from my work would be a reason to doubt my intelligence, to say, like, how can you be so simple? You're so feeble-minded that you can watch this stuff. When I could hear his car in front of my house, I was already thinking, is everything in place the way it should be? Because I don't want him to, I don't want to trigger any anger because his anger could be triggered by the littlest and smallest things. I was always being overly nice. To protect myself, I had to make sure he didn't become angry. So I had to make myself smaller to do so, you know, like, almost make no noise in the house, um, dress a certain way, not look at people on the streets because he would get angry if I got attention. If someone looked at me, then I would go home and I would hear about it the rest of the night. Most psychopaths are severely damaged little children and they have not been able to go through normal development. So they can be very demanding you have to behave exactly in a certain way, otherwise they blow up or they harass you. What is behind that is that most psychopaths that are in reality um, little children with arrested development, they have no theory of mind. So they cannot, as adults do, spontaneously take into account that other people 
have an other viewpoint than themselves. Uh, she had like, um, how do you say that, uh, a, a monopoly on the truth. I don't know if, if that is uh, the right way to say it. Like everything she would say would be the truth and the only truth. No matter what, it, what, the, what the topic would be about, if it was something on the news, her opinion was, was the truth. So there was no way of arguing with her. Not, you couldn't, I mean, if you would be talking about politics or relationships with other people or the kind of music you like or which kind of games or films you like, her opinion was the truth. Mostly, he would keep me hostage and he would keep me hostage for many, many, many hours. Sometimes he would do that for the whole night and he would just keep me seated at a chair and I, I wasn't allowed to get up or to walk away. And if I tried to walk away, he would grab my arms, push me again and say like, if I said, oh, you're hurting me, he would say like, oh yeah, you're just doing that to yourself because you're trying to escape. Yeah, he didn't just kind of push you, he pushed you up through the hall. He didn't just kind of kick you, he kicked you down. He didn't just, you know, he, he told you he was, you were hard to love or you were unattractive. That's abuse. But it didn't feel like abuse until it just felt like I was being sensitive still, until it was over and then I was like, oh wait. Unfortunately, most people don't recognize narcissistic abuse. And that's mainly because there's a lack of knowledge. So knowledge is very important to avoid it. Otherwise, uh, not only partners, but also children and whole families can be negatively affected by it. It's one of the most dangerous forms of abuse, even if it doesn't give any bruises sometimes. Not always, but a lot of times you cannot find any physical uh, abuse. So that's what's making it so difficult to recognize and to see or even to understand when it happens to yourself. When I found out I was allergic to gluten, I felt so much better after I stopped eating them. But he, instead of being happy that his girlfriend was feeling better, he was constantly, on a daily basis, telling me I looked horrible, um, that I was just making it up. He was saying like, yeah, it's all in your mind. You're not allergic to gluten. You're just, yeah, you're just crazy. Psychopaths often try to convince a prey that he or she is crazy. And uh, when they succeed in making someone doubt himself, they weaken that person immensely. Because doubt very quickly makes you lose your energy, makes you lose your self-confidence, and then they can more easily move you around, manipulate you, make you doubt yourself even more. This is how the prey is being destroyed. And an example of that we see in the films Gaslighting. I came home and I put my keys on the table and went about my business, went back to that spot on the table, couldn't find my keys. I asked him where they were. He said he didn't know. I went to the house looking like crazy, returned to the living room, found my keys where I put them in the first place. And I, I remember saying they weren't here a second ago. And he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Are you, are you sure you're fine? You're acting kind of crazy. Gaslighting, it's a process of rendering another person mentally ill. And that is, of course, the worst thing you can do to a person. Even physical wounds are never as bad as driving someone insane. Most of this relationship I spent in a state of total confusion. Like for instance, um, 
one time he hurt me physically really bad, so bad that I had bruises on my my arms and I was ready to get out of this relationship and I sent him pictures of of my bruises saying this is not this is not good. When I saw him the next day, I thought he was going to apologize. But when he came in, he had his wrist in bandage. I asked him if he had an accident at work or something, but he claimed that I had done that to him. I went over the past night again and again in my mind and I was 100% sure I never even touched him. But then I could see his wrist in bandage and it got me really confused. He told me I was crazy. He told me there was something wrong with my memory and instead of doubting him and his manipulative tactics, I doubted myself. I had no idea what gaslighting was and that he was just trying to stop me from going to the police. And even though down, deep down, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, I felt guilty anyway. And I stayed in the relationship. Gaslighting is relentless. It is planned. It is evil. There's no re respite. There's no retreat. No, no way to avoid it. The abuser gaslights you via the phone, via chats, physically, online, offline. There's nowhere to, to escape. There's nowhere to go. And the voice of the abuser is inside your head forever, the introject. So you can't even escape the abuser by going no contact. That's the only abuse technique where no contact doesn't work. I came up with the strategy of no contact in 1997 and immediately victims told me, yes, I can go no contact if he beats me. I can go no contact if he shouts at me. I can go no contact if he steals my money. But how do I go no contact? If his voice is inside my mind, telling me all the time, you're crazy. You see you're crazy? You see you're delusional? You see you have hallucinations? You see, how do I get rid of this voice? And indeed you can't. This voice goes with you. And it goes with you long, long after the relationship is over. That's the main problem with gaslighting. You doubt yourself essentially forever. I absolutely believed I was crazy so much so that I went to the psychologist and sat there and, and looked at what that woman in all seriousness and said I think I'm crazy I think I have completely lost um, my entire mind that's how much I believed it I started becoming paranoid I started becoming anxious because I didn't believe my own reality I didn't even believe my own memories when he grabbed my throat and denied it, I was like, you know what, maybe my memory is off. That's how insane I felt. She called me crazy every day. <laughs> Especially when I would, uh, when she got caught on, on certain things, like for instance, the cheating or stealing money from me or whatever. If, I, if you would confront her with something that she did, she would go crazy and she would, you know, call me crazy for thinking that. He would call me a whore out of the blue or call me crazy. And when I responded and said like, why would you say something horrible like that? Then he would say like, I never said that. See, you're crazy. It's literally crazy making. He would say something and then immediately take it back and say, I never said that, grab my throat. I never grabbed your throat. You are so mean that you would ever make stuff like that up. What is wrong with you? That's what he did. The narcissist himself does not perceive reality properly. The narcissist has something called cognitive deficits. He reinterprets reality to support his grandiosity. And so he would tend to conflict with the victim. The victim would say something and the narcissist would say, that's not true, it never happened, I never said that. They isolate you from others so you can't test your truth. And when you can't test your truth, everything they say becomes the truth. And, uh, you know, that's why gaslighting works. Because you can't, you know, nudge your friend and be like, is this real or what? Because you won't have any friends anymore. Because you are only invested in him. Every time you want to meet up with someone who isn't him, he'll have some kind of crisis, which makes you stay at home. She was cheating on me and not with one person, with a lot of people. 
So I got upset about that. I never touched her. I raised my voice. You know what what uh, is going on? Um, and that got turned around into that I had an aggression problem, which then in the end resulted that I saw a psychologist for about a year that she um, found for me that I had to drive for up and down from my job every week for about three hours to see this psychologist that she picked for me to work on my aggression problem. And I went there every, every week for a whole year just to find out that there was nothing wrong with me. Uh, he would tell a lie and I didn't fall for it. And he got really, really angry with me because I didn't fall for it. And then he would just randomly break up with me because he said I wasn't worthy of him because I didn't trust him or whatever. And, and then um, after I presented him with the facts, of course, he would come crawling back and make it into a joke or something. But he would always like turn tables. He would always twist the facts. Like he would say things like, yeah, I was, uh, I was using him, for instance, while the facts were that he was staying in my house, not paying rent. Um, not doing anything to participate, not even uh, look for a house for himself. So yeah, he would every time, I think every time he felt like he was doing something that was imbalanced, he would just blame somebody else so he didn't have to take responsibility for it. The narcissist doesn't want to see, feel certain feelings by himself. So that's why he's going to project it on somebody else. So the behavior is just totally turn around. Everything he does, he will put on you. If he tells you, and you have no clue what he's talking about, that you are a financial um, holding something back, you can be sure that he's gonna do that. Yeah, oh yeah, you would say stuff like, um, you know, you're very hard to love people have a hard time being around you and I feel like he was just talking about himself he knew that he was hard to be around he knew he was hard to love and he just projected all of that on me you know like uh, saying I was very argumentative knowing that he cannot be in a, in a in a company without getting into an argument with people and stuff like that he would project all the things he knew he was doing wrong and he felt probably kind of insecure about onto me so he didn't have to deal with it himself then it was just my problem instead of his i discovered a pattern in when i was feeling very happy and very strong those were the moments when he started picking fights, belittling me, criticizing me, keeping me hostage for hours. And when I felt like completely broken and down, that's the moment where he switched like a button and all of a sudden was the sweetest and kindest man in the world saying things like, oh, I see you're feeling so down and you know I'm always there for you and that that exact moment is where the confusion started because this happened so often that the same person who is trying to destroy you is giving you discomfort and saying all these nice things to you and inside my mind i just i just didn't know if like is he a good person is he a bad person in the end i was convincing myself like oh but he's nice to me now so Maybe he's not that bad after all. And that's what kept me in this relationship. She was perfect, you know. Whenever I would go against whatever she had to say, she was, I guess, better with words or better with a kind of manipulation or something that I just, she just put me in the corner and she was right. Also in my view, although I'm, I was really sure that I w I'm not that kind of person, I would never cheat, I would never, do those kind of things when I'm in a, in a relationship. She hit something um, in me where I thought, well, maybe she's right. Maybe I am that kind of person. So it made me doubt about myself a lot. And this happened 
within the first couple of months and it just grew, grew stronger and stronger and then you know towards the end of the relationship you just don't have any clue who you are anymore at least in my case this relationship could not have existed had i not been that confused there was no sense of self left i remember I went to the bathroom at work a lot just to look at myself to see if I was there because I felt like I wasn't there at all, completely worthless. Like All I was was a, an instrument for him in every way. I didn't feel like who I was mattered. I didn't feel um, adequate. I didn't feel like I was worth anything completely annihilated. I didn't feel like I existed even. It's very strange. But the strange thing is at the moment, I didn't really feel that as being abused. It was more like if the feeling you get that there, that there was something wrong with me, that I was a person that would look at other women or wouldn't treat her right, or she had a reason to feel like she did. I think what you go through as a victim of narcissism is the closest thing to brainwashing. Like, all CIA tactics aside, I think narcissists rely on you not relying on yourself. They need you to not, not take yourself seriously in that way. They need you to ignore everything, all the glaring red flags, all the unhealthy stuff, they need you to not pay attention to it. And the only way they can make you look over those things is by brainwashing the hell out of you. Nothing you think is real. Nothing exists without their permission. Get me thinking like would I ever if somebody is like crying and saying please stop what you're doing like would I ever want to continue what I'm doing if somebody is doing that and I would just I felt like I would just like feel so guilty and that exact feeling that was lacking in him he, he never felt guilt he never felt remorse he never felt like Oh, I'm so sorry for making you cry, or I'm so sorry for, for making you feel so down. It was like he felt he had the right to abuse me and hurt me like that. And that was when I felt like something really important is lacking in this person. He didn't have empathy. Narcissists blame others for what's happening to them for their misbehavior, for their defeats, misfortune, etc., etc. They never take responsibility. They never assume guilt or blame. They are always the victimized party. So they believe it. And it is this inner conviction that shines through. The narcissist, when the narcissist claims that he's a victim, he doesn't come across as though he's acting because he is not acting. He truly believes he's a victim. I saw that he only had these type of feelings of empathy when it was about him, like when his feelings were hurt. So for instance, when after he had abused me, I didn't want to see him for, for a while. And to him, that was really painful. So he didn't have like this action reaction feeling. He would always leave out the action. So he would always leave out the abuse also in the stories that he would tell people. He would never tell about the abuse. He would always tell about, oh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she doesn't want to see me anymore. And I think he just didn't, he didn't register. He didn't, well, I think that's what empathy is. You register somebody else's pain or the hurt you cause in another, in another person. He couldn't do that. He couldn't feel like, oh, this woman is crying and begging me to stop because I hurt her so much. I should stop now. He didn't have that. Uh, you, you, can, you can't approach these, these people that have this thing like they are normal human beings because you expect if you're in a relationship with anybody that there's a certain level of empathy and, and you know, and when that's not there, don't pretend to think that these people think the same way as you do.
this is one thing that uh, for me is like the core of this whole thing that we st if you're in a relationship with somebody like that you because you have empathy you think that the other person has has that as well and so when you think about the other person you think with that perspective but when that empathy is lacking these are different kind of these people are programmed differently so you can never have your the the the, the thoughts that you have about what's normal they don't have it so don't pro project that on them Psychopaths lack conscience and empathy. That may also go for uh, people with narcissistic personality disorder, but it may not apply in sufficient uh, measure for some narcissists to be able to say that they are also psychopaths and is that they lack a foundation completely. And then found their foundation insight may be weakened but it may not altogether be absent or insignificant. The percentage of people who have a personality disorder is estimated around 10% of the population. I estimate that around 5% of the population also has psychopathy. She had a small son and whenever there was something wrong with the son, I would be the one to take care of that. She, she wouldn't be able to relate to him or um, so it was so blatant with her she could see it so clearly that she missed that empathy that she she couldn't act like she did so she would just full out say it I don't give a shit about anything or anybody so that's different than other people that have this she she didn't have that acting those acting skills in that in that sense no my ex was really good at acting. Whenever I was sick, he sounded so nice on the phone saying that he would cook for me and take care of me. But when he came over, he expected me to be better <laughs> and he would be very annoyed if I wasn't. Even when I was puking or when I had fever, he would scream at me and wouldn't let me sleep all night. And this wasn't just one time. This happened so many times that whenever I got sick, I told him to stay away. Because he didn't only make me more sick, he also took away my son's mother. Because my ex, well, he would go home and he would sleep. But I had to take care of my son, being even more sick than I was before. And I think the problem with these people is that they are so good with this acting and coming off as empathetic, that it takes a while to understand what's going on. Especially, well, in my case at least, when he was playing victim afterwards. I have stepped over a lot of my own feelings because he triggered my empathy towards him. But, well, of course, uh, a person who has empathy doesn't do these things. You know, if we would, I don't know, watch tennis, She'd say, well, if I would have started as a kid, I would be better than anybody. If it was about music, literature, whatever, you know, her opinions about any topic would be better than anybody else's. He felt significantly better than other people, even than his friends. He would, they were the only people who had patience with him for, I think, unhealthy reasons, you know, but um, even them, he would look down on. He would look down on everyone. He was. It's so lonely being the king of your castle, you know, like uh, the king of the hill. <laughs> I constantly had to prove I was loyal, had to prove I loved him, had to prove he was the best man alive, and he would always come up with reasons why my love wasn't true and would randomly accuse me of things. And even before things happened, he would go like, I know you're going to do this, or you're going to do that. And it would be something really, really bad that was quite the opposite of the person I am or what I would ever do. And I would ask him, do you have any idea who I am? 
But to him, he was always right and I was always wrong. He said he knew me better than I knew myself. So whenever he accused me of something, I had no right to defend myself. He was completely unable to see me for who I was and projected a lot of negativity onto me. She, she, well, she, to me, she had like, she had the monopoly to the truth. Uh, everything that she would say would be the truth, her opinion would be the truth, so there was no discussing anything. I stayed with him because I felt I had to, because my sense of self and identity was so intertwined with his that I felt like I would actually cease to exist without him. And that is how completely dysfunctional abuse can be. I felt helpless. I remember daydreaming about someone saving me because I felt I wasn't capable of doing it myself. As a grown woman, I was so... I was made to feel so worthless and useless that I felt like I couldn't even make a difference for myself and my own life. That's how insidious that abuse is. It just plants a seed and then it grows. Many times I was um, at the point of leaving him and thinking, okay, this is it, I'm, I'm going to go. But just at the moment, I really wanted to get out. He would do something so nice, so, or he would come up to me for help, and sometimes he would even be crying and explaining how he was like a victim of his own behavior. Like he was um, crying because he knew he was... Yeah, he had this anger problem and he had this, uh, yeah. People who have strong empathy and who are able to see the unrealized potential inside the psychopath may feel that they cannot leave that person because it's very difficult for them to be not loyal to someone because they have very strong loyalty to people in general. And also, um, Psychopaths are very good in triggering the caring instinct in people. And uh, when people have a strong caring instinct, it also has a very strong grip on them. They feel that they have a moral duty to help this person. And in that way, you know, when they are in a relationship with this person, either a personal or a professional relationship, they are not able to abandon a lost it is very difficult to leave somebody who is asking you for help so and I didn't see that was a part of his manipulation so I um, whenever I was helping him I felt safe and also when he asked for help I thought at the same time he was admitting like there is something wrong and he needs help and there is change there's going to be the change for the better so I thought okay so when I help him I will only see this nice guy that I saw in the beginning I will only see this nice part of him again and all the abuse is gonna go away maybe it was very naive but it sounded and seemed very sincere the way he presented it so because you're already not yourself anymore don't have to say it anymore and you don't know really what's going on, it's really hard to get out. And then a lot of times, when you do get out, the narcissist is not willing to let you go. Of course, it's all about power and control. So if the relationship is ending, the narcissist is losing the control over you. So that's something they can't uh, cope with. So that's why they will keep on trying to get you back. And they're so good in all this mm, acting 
that uh, they will act like a prince again. And you remember the high feelings you had from the beginning of the relationship. And you always want that feeling back. So what's next thing will happen that you think, well, maybe I didn't see it right. Maybe I should try it again. And then there you go on again and again. And every time you go back, you will get weaker. So every time it's harder to get out. She would call me from, from morning till night and, and leaving messages like this long about how I, was, how I was so perfect for her. And she would even apologize for stuff that, that, that she did and that I was, I was right about everything and that she needed help and she couldn't live without me and I was her savior. And yeah, I w we were back right where we started in the beginning of the relationship. It was that thing again, like all, all uh, lovey-dovey. <laughs> he'd keep sending me messages or he'd make sure I, I knew that he had a new girlfriend within a week, obviously, because narcissists don't exist without supply so he needed a new one immediately and he made sure the news reached me so he wanted to in that way kind of um, be on top of what I was doing by you know rather than the, the scene we were in was very small so he, he would find out what I was doing via other people he would look at all my socials and I blocked him everywhere but that, that's what he was trying to do you know just trying to stay in my life in that way or trying to push my buttons in that way. When he wanted me back, literally everything changed about him. I was no longer crazy for being a spiritual person. Now he liked it too. Everything I liked, he liked. He seemed very empathetic all of a sudden, talking about feelings and he was crying when he told me how sorry he was for abusing me and that he wanted a second chance. He said that the new him would never do that. At that time, I didn't know as much about narcissism yet. And I thought, well, maybe he has changed. Maybe I should give him a second try. And just when I was getting close enough, he returned right back into his old abusive self. It was all a show. And he was already isolating me and setting me up against the new friends I had made after leaving him. He did threaten me, but in a very, very mean way. I think the meanest way in which to threaten a woman, and that was um, sexually. He would, of course, if someone is super mean to you, you don't feel like having sex with them, which is, you know, like not rocket science that I didn't want to have sex with him. And then he would threaten me and say, if you don't want to do it, I'll find someone else who will, uh, which he did. But obviously it's a very, mean way to threaten a woman that's already very insecure. When we were in the relationship and there were some moments with her that she kind of showed her real self and she said, watch out, I'm going to destroy you. I'm, I'm saving up stuff about you and I'm going to destroy you. And I just thought, oh, this is so sad. You know, there's something really, well, not wrong with her, but it's so sad that she has to say these kind of things. I didn't believe her, but at the end she did. He would make threats like, if you ever leave me, I will destroy you, I will break you, I will call everybody and make sure nobody wants anything to do with you or wants to work with you ever again. And that's exactly what he did. I expected him to do it in that aggressive way, but he, he did it in like uh, a very victimized way, like he was the victim, I was the evil person. I found out that she was cheating on me with somebody. Um, and on Facebook, I saw that she was with, some, with that person in Mexico, I think. Uh, of course, I, I called a lot of times and I wrote her a letter and stuff. What's going on, you know? But then at the end, I went to her house because I just wanted to know, did we break up? What, what the hell is happening? So I rang the door. Um, she opened it real quick, she closed the door again. I was completely nervous and think, what the, what, what just happened? So I went downstairs from, from, from the door of her apartment into the streets. Within two seconds, police officers show up. They handcuff me and take me to the station. 
And I was just sitting there, what, what happened? This is completely not true. And I, and I read the report and all the stuff that was in there was just nothing but lies, lies, lies and lies that she had been saving up for years, you know, with little pieces of emails of me, which she all collected and put a whole, she fabricated a whole story around me, which they told me, you're going to be in jail for a re really long time. Yeah, um, he did a smear campaign, starting with calling people, uh, people he knew, people I knew, work-based people. He, he called my friends, and he was he was trying to set up everybody against me by saying things like, "Oh, you should know what she is saying about you," and he would tell like the the craziest lies about me, the, the meanest and lowest things that you can possibly imagine. Like he would take this very tiny little bit out of a story, like a very painful story out of my childhood, for instance, or he would use a miscarriage I had and presented it in such a way that I looked very crazy or evil. And so he would use my, he would use my deepest wounds against me in the smear campaign and to, yeah, to make me look as if I was crazy. The victims are usually devastated. They are ruined. They are ruined mentally. They are ruined physically also. There are physical, physiological effects to trauma. They're traumatized, they're broken, they're wounded. They don't have time or inclination to present their case. They just want to lie in bed and withdraw. They are depressed clinically. They, they have anxiety disorders. They have mood disorders. I mean, the victims are devastated. Narcissus is untouched by the crisis because the narcissist has no emotions, no empathy, no nothing. Narcissus is a machine. So the narcissist goes on to present his version of events, which is expertly put together. He's a, pro he's a professional at storytelling. He presents himself as a victim and there is no countervailing voice. The victim is too devastated to do anything about it and to present her side. The narcissist is the lone voice, usually, at the beginning. Not for the whole duration, but in the first few critical weeks, it's usually the narcissist is the lone voice. The victim is not heard. And that's the version that sticks. Okay, I think that that's, was what hit me the most, that from, from the starting of the relationship till the end, it was all one big film that she invented for herself and, and she you know she knew exactly what she was going to do she was going to destroy me and she knew that from day one and she actually told me a couple of times during the smear campaign i realized that he wasn't just telling his side of the story he was trying to destroy me he tried to ruin my reputation my career my friendships, and was basically trying to isolate me again by trying to take away my support system. And on top of that, he was smearing and playing victim on social media, stating that I was the one doing those things to him, even though I had been silent from the start. So I guess the whole relationship is with one big smear campaign. And of course, you know, the smaller smear things are on Facebook, where she put public posts like, watch out, my ex-boyfriend uh, is going to try to do this and this and this to me. If any of my friends, if he contacts any of my friends, please tell me so I can report it to the police and he's harassing me and all of that bullshit. But the biggest thing was that whole, one big story that she made up and throughout these years just to get me in jail. And she, she told me this before, she did it to her ex, uh, you know, so I should have seen it coming, but that was a smack in the face like you wouldn't believe. Being in jail about a lie, you know, that really hurt me a lot. They will tell lies about you. Very simple. The whole life's a lie, but they will tell lies about you and about the relationship. And bad things, they will make it up. He was trying to make everybody he knew uh, accomplice to the abuse, even though they had no idea they were doing it. And, but he had a best friend and she knew what he was like. She is exactly like him and she would yeah, send emails to my friend, telling my friend to uh, reconsider the friendship, 
tell the craziest lies. She would just repeat all the lies that he was telling about me and she would just repeat them to anybody willing to listen. Abuse by proxy is a phrase I coined in 95 to describe uh, the use of third parties to perpetuate and perpetrate the abuse. And flying monkeys are the people who are, who are used to do this. Most, the overwhelming majority of flying monkeys do not realize that they are being used and also do not realize that their conduct is abusive. The narcissist might convince his flying monkeys that they are doing the victim a service, that they're helping the victim, that uh, in some way they are restoring justice, or that he is a victim and who, there should be redress, or that he just needs a small favor to get everything restarted when he's trying to hoover the victim, etc., etc. So the flying monkeys are always egocentric. In other words, they always feel good about what they're doing. That's why it's extremely difficult to break the cycle of abuse by proxy, because the flying monkeys feel good about it. They are taking the narcissist side because they believe that what they are doing is virtuous, is worthwhile, is justified, and it's impossible to stop them because of that. Had they felt bad about what they were doing, it would have been much easier to break this. So the smear campaign is the perfect proof that narcissism are are not able to love. Because if you ever ever had a connection with someone like that, they want normal people, normal mental, healthy people won't do that. They cannot talk so bad about you, even if there was a fight. And there will be some emotions, but not that big as with a narcissist. Because a psychopath is not dependable, it may induce in his quarry hyper-alertness. Hyper-alertness is a result of the production of stress hormones. And ultimately, when um, we people are uh, built to handle short periods of stress, not chronic stress, so when we are uh, in chronic stress in the environment of somebody who is destructive most of the time, not dependable, it may be exhausting for us. So what you often see in people who become victims of psychopaths, that is that their energy level has gone down very much. And when the energy level goes down, when the vitality has been um, undermined, then all kinds of diseases can come up. You can develop chronic diseases huh, that are due to a lack of vitality, that might be cancer, for instance, huh? uh, depression, burnout, and they might also be severely traumatized. The abuse affected my health big time. I, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, ME, um, I had panic attacks and sleeping problems that I never had before and yeah I was extremely exhausted and my self-esteem was at the lowest level ever. Anxiety, depression, uh, I got a burnout, I lost weight, I started under eating and then I started overeating. Um, I was just overall incredibly unstable, mentally unstable. I felt physically sick also, I got sick a lot. If your brain's in a healthy environment, there's expansion, there's growth, there's air. In an uh, unhealthy, abusive environment, there's shrink. So your brain will get smaller. Kind of, it's very simplistic told. But, and what does it mean? That you cannot think outside of the little circles. So your brain and your thoughts will be going around in circles. And 
it will all make you depressed, emotionally unstable, and it will continue as long as you're in this unhealthy environment. Everything in love will grow. It's also with your brain. Everything in fear will shrink. That's the same thing with the uh, with the abuse. My mental health was, I don't know, physically there was nothing wrong with me. I think so. But besides that, I slept a lot more than I used to. But mentally, I just, um, um, I used to be quite active in a lot of stuff, you know, social things, meeting friends, making music. I was making music all the time. After this happened, I just didn't care about anything anymore. I just stopped making music. I wasn't interested in the world anymore. So my mental, mentally, <laughs> I wasn't doing that great. The damage done to the prey can be very deep. So it can be not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but also what is called moral injury where there is damage to the core of a person. And um, what we often see also in people who have dealt with a psychopath for a long time, that is they lose the ability to trust anyone. And so they lose the ability to be in a relationship. So your brain needs to have some more expansion if something like this happened to you, narcissistic abuse, to get out of the circles you're thinking, you need to expand in every possible way. So there's a lot of health things you can do to bring your brain back in a better situation. Like everything which is healthy for you in normal life is healthy for your brain. Like oxygen, water, training, nice environments, nature, whatever there is. Many people who have become traumatized by a psycho psychopath feel that they need to do trauma work in order to heal themselves. But it is very important to take into account how much self-healing capacity is there? How much ego strength is there? Because if the self-healing capacity is too low, if one has been weakened too much and one does trauma work, for instance EMDR, then it is possible that one gets re-traumatized and that the problem becomes even more severe. So what I recommend to people is that they invest in their inner comfort by giving themselves many, many, many positive experiences that are nourishing for themselves and that um, strengthen their foundation. And then when they are strong enough and the need is still there to do trauma work, then it is much safer to do it. abuse in my in my childhood and it geared me up for this relationship it really did because um, I think I subconsciously recognized his behavior and felt comfortable with it because it was what I was used to I was used to having my um, feelings ignored having my emotions minimized so even if it's unhealthy if it's something you're used to, you're comfortable with it. If you've had a nice childhood, a nice person is going to feel like home. Well, the same goes for abusers. If you've grown up with abusers, you feel attracted to this certain type of energy that abusers have. It's, it, they're like unconscious patterns. They're, it's not like you really choose for it. It's just they feel so familiar that you feel attracted to them. I think my mom was a narcissist too, but a covert narcissist, so she wasn't grandiose, she was the opposite. She made herself extremely small so that everyone would flock around her with attention. 
because my brothers were very sensitive to that because I feel like boys and their moms have a different bond. They just wanted her happy and she controlled them by like being this banshee, you know, but being always being um, the victim, crying. How can you do this to your mother, you know? My father, he was like a full on narcissistic psychopath, even though he was a person who would be very kind and friendly to the outside world. Behind closed doors, he was, he was, he was like a monster. And because his abuse was so openly, I felt from a very young age, like I don't need anything from this guy. Nothing good comes from this guy. So all my hopes as a child went to my mom. So I, got, I felt really close to my mom. So the damage done to me was much worse by my mom because I didn't see it coming. What I do blame her for is kind of not making sure me and my brothers had a good bond. She basically drove us apart by means of favoritism. They were a team and I was just an island. She was very manipulative. She would set people up against each other. Uh, she would always criticize, belittle, uh, laugh about other people behind their backs. Um, use the children and use the talents of children to make herself look good, but emotionally neglect the children. She would like have a favorite and make the other person or the other kid feel like less worthy and the favorite child that would uh, it would change it, it wasn't the same person all the time I felt like in a lot of ways she was envious of me because I was a girl and I just did things I was confident I don't know where I got the confidence but I was confident I was very entrepreneurial I did things even though no one helped me or no one supported me and I felt like she I was kind of envious of my drive that I got from literally nowhere because no one ever encouraged me to do anything. Mm. Yet here I was, I was writing books and I was doing things and I, I think she was kind of envious. And um, when I learned about narcissism, I was finally able to understand my childhood because earlier, sometimes I would still get angry at my mom thinking like, how could, how, could she, how could she do that to me? How could she be so insensitive or so mean to me? But once I learned about narcissism and the one thing that narcissists don't have is empathy. So when I learned that she didn't have empathy and that it wasn't really her fault as well because she was a victim too, I finally realized that it had nothing to do with me. And to me, that part, that it had nothing to do with me was very important for my healing process. I come from a loving family. I got everything that I ever wanted and all of that stuff, but I'm just completely naive. I grew up in, a, in an environment where, where, which was very safe. And I, when somebody tells me something, I believe them. I trust everybody. I trust everything all the time. So I guess if somebody sees a person like me, I'm, I'm an easy prey because you can tell me anything and I'll believe you. Looking back on it, the most important part of being a victim, yeah, victim, I hate the word, of being with a narcissist is being codependent. You have to feel like your happiness and someone else's happiness can't exist next to each other and it has to come from somewhere, from childhood maybe. Maybe as a kid you were used to, you know, ignoring your own sadness to uh, bring the family together or make sure everyone else felt better. And you take that into adulthood, you try to say, it's kind of like savior syndrome. Like if he's with me, if I love him enough, then it'll be fine. If, I, if I'm empathetic enough, if I'm patient enough, he'll be fine. I went in therapy, I, um, I knew I had a problem with boundaries, I was too forgiving, I was too much of a, a people pleaser, I was always trying to keep the peace even though 
I was harming myself as well. The more I stayed away from this person and the more I learned about narcissism, because I had no idea what narcissism was, so I learned the traits. And I also learned that I had dealt with narcissistic people a lot. And so I saw a pattern there and once I knew what the pattern was, I could break it. The moment I started to remove these type of people out of my life, I started to feel better. I started to feel happier. My health was improving. Every level of my life started to improve. It was a progress. In the beginning, I was just broken. I would look in the mirror and I would see no one I recognized. And my inner voice was replaced with his. So every time I looked at myself, I heard, you are unattractive, you know, you are dumb, you are like, I don't understand how anyone can, can handle being with you. That's what I heard for the longest of time. And what I did was not resist it. I would just sit in that feeling, not rejecting it, not, not fighting it. And then at some point I just knew logically that at some point, if you take it one day at a time, it'll get better. And I noticed when, when I didn't cry every morning, then okay, so that that's done. Now we can work on what got you in this situation in the first place. Um, I find it a lot harder to trust people after this happened because before that I was naive and I trusted everybody and whatever somebody would say, I would think that's the truth and I would trust them. I don't do that anymore. Um, well, I have to reframe, rephrase that. I, I still do, but I noticed the red flags a lot sooner. I still trust people. I still believe what they say in the first, um, when I first hear it. But as soon as there's something off a little bit, the red flags go up and I'm, and I'm out. I don't want to have anything to do with these people anymore. I'm really, I'm much more, I trust everybody, but as soon as they make one little mistake, that's it. I got a lot more sensitive. I notice the small things that are off. It is a lot harder for me to trust people, especially because you simply can't guarantee yourself that you'll never meet another narcissist. But I just promised myself to really go with that gut feeling. Like if I see signs of manipulation or isolation, for instance, I'm not staying as long as I would have stayed earlier. In a relationship, you should feel like yourself. And my biggest sign that I'm dealing with a narcissist is that I'm feeling smaller, like I have to fight to be seen, you know? And in any case, that's not a healthy dynamic. So yeah, I've learned to choose for my own happiness. And as long as I can trust myself on making strong decisions, I'll be fine. I wasn't given a lot, but I was given an extremely strong personality. I. I feel like the, the, the core of who I am has stayed the same. And I lost that for a second. I lost it. And after him, I just found it back again. Honestly, I just picked up where I left off with a healthier sense of self-worth, basically. This is maybe strange, but I always felt it was immediately after it happened, I, I felt this can be the worst thing that ever happened to me or it can be the best thing that ever happened to me and it turned out it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it really made me rediscover myself in a way and and notice because before i met her i had a lot of friends and did a lot of social things and blah blah, blah i don't know and it all went away when i was in a relationship and afterwards i found out that i still have that and my friends came back to me and I am a, a good and a nice person and a, for, for some reason I appreciated it a lot more after this thing happened. If you had plans before, you'll have plans after. You know what I mean? If you were someone who is dedicated to making something out of theirself, themselves, you will. You might have to work through trauma, but you'll get there. So if a narcissist would see that I'm so much better than now, they would probably say, see, see, I did that. <laughs> That's what I did. It was good for something. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Friends know not, lovers do. I met a different kind of you. Oh yeah. 
In a way, the perfect guy said he loved me until I died. But then, oh well. Didn't see your jealousy was slowly suffocating me like. Who is he? And who's he to you? Wanted me to prove my love. No kind of proof was enough. With no boundaries to your anger, hurting me. I'm so confused. Thought I could heal wounds with love. Turn your anger into love. Oh no. My friend said, "Be no fool. Don't let him do that shit to you. We should treat." That love is blind. I hate for this love to go to waste. I'm losing myself more each day. If I could try a little more, a little. It's the cure for us to find peace. Eggshells break under my feet. How hard I tried, I couldn't compete with your ever-changing needs. You were mad, oh so mad. Your words still echo in my head, screaming, "You're so naive." All I could do was run, run, but there was only one conclusion. Protect this heart of mine. I hate for this love to go to waste. I'm losing myself. See.